Folks, yeah, as uh, Llewellyn said, my name is Nico Mini. I'm a technical director at the Clay Brick Association. I also manage and um, own a brick factory in Port Elizabeth called Algoa Brick. So I'm in the industry, and um, as industry players, we, we volunteer our services to the association. And today, just shortly, I, I might have to skip over one or two slides because of the timing, but um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the clay brick industry, uh, what the association does for the industry, and then also um, our life cycle assessment um, study that, that we did in 2013 that we completed about a year and a half ago with the University of Pretoria. And there was some good research work uh, in that, and then lastly, talking about sustainability uh, as an industry and as different factories. Uh, just to give you a, a background to the industry, there's two uh, sectors in the brickmaking industry. I'm talking about clay brick industry. You've got the formal sector, which is obviously represented by mostly, most, most of the formal sector belongs to the association. And there we're talking about a, about 120 companies across, the, across, 120 companies across the country. And on average, each of them do about 20 million units per annum. Obviously, there's the big players that does up to 80, 100 million. And then you've got the small um, farming brick makers that does less. We do about 3.5 billion bricks per annum at the moment. And I think we're sitting at about 70% of capacity. Uh, and then 90% plus of our brick factories is coal-fired. And then we um, provide 15,000 jobs. And we are fully compliant. Uh, so then on the other hand, you've got the informal sector. Some of them refer to um, riverside or riverbed brick makers. Um, a lot of this informal sector, you find about 80% of them you find in the Eastern Cape, from East London up to Ellaville North. But they are significant. They do between 5,000 and 100,000 bricks per month. And then they provide uh, jobs for about 5,000 people, which is quite significant. There's absolutely no compliance there. But they are not, they're very small operators and they're not part of the association. I'm going to skip past the video just quickly to show you some of the technologies and how we make bricks. Uh, one of the first ones, and this is the most popular one still as we speak, is clam kilns. Um, and basically what, what happens here is the clay is mixed with the uh, right amount of fuel, packed into a format, format like this, and then lit at the bottom. They add a little bit of extra coal there. It's covered, it's lit, and it's left for between six to nine weeks to burn. And then um, you would then at the end sort out the products that you would need. One of the problems with clam kilns is very difficult to determine the emissions on it because it's an open uh, kiln. So what, with the help, again, with the University of Pretoria and the Claybrick Association, we, bu we build a simulation unit uh, outside Pretoria where we actually simulated clams. We had some uh, members bringing bricks, and we fired these clams in the simulation unit, and all the emissions were caught and measured at a, at a, at a chimney. And what was actually quite um, astonishing is that uh, the the particulates and the nitrogen oxide was a lot lower than what we expected. Obviously, your SO2 is directly proportioned to the type of coal that you use and the amount of coal that you use. As I spoke about the riverbed guys or the informal guys, you'll find them uh, mostly in the Eastern Cape and then some of them in Mpumalanga, where they would, anywhere where they would find some sort of clay, they would make bricks. And they would use anything from ash next to railway lines to straw to burn this product and there's absolutely no control and the environment gets damaged through this process. And uh, I will speak about it a little bit later, but it's one of the projects that the CBA has taken on board to try and assist these guys to become more um, sustainable and more uh, environmental friendly. Some of the sustainability successes, uh, after our life cycle assessment and after we got the results of the life cycle assessment, uh, the CBA, um, with the help of Swiss Contact, uh, or the Energy Efficient Clay Brick Project, uh, went to some brick makers that wanted different technologies than clamp operations, and we went around the world, we looked at, at, um, at 
alternative technologies, and here we're not talking about modern tunnel kilns because those are mostly unaffordable, and um, we introduced some of these technologies to the clay brick makers to become more sustainable and emit less, less emissions. One of them were um, VSPKs, or vertical shaft kilns. Um, there's a lot of these kilns um, running in India, Nepal, China. Um, typically, that's what you would find in India. And uh, we brought the technology with the help of Swiss Contact to our members. And as I speak, there's already three factories, one Jeffreys Bay, one Mossel Bay, and then one in, outside Peter Maritzburg that's running these VSPKs. And you can see that as South African brickmakers, they've made it quite modern and they've made it quite neat. And what is quite significant about this is that the energy consumption, the CO2 emissions were nearly halved from these people's previous clamps. So that was quite a, a significant saving. Another technology that was introduced, and there's one uh, that's built and being built in Booster. There's another one built outside, or they're busy building another one outside Pretoria. It's uh, zigzag kilns. And again here, um, it reduces a lot of the coal usage, which obviously has a knock-on effect on emissions, and it reduces production time from 30 days to 7 days. Then also in the existing modern kilns, uh, like tunnel kilns, um, technology transfers happened, help and assistance were given by the Clay Brick Association to our members to improve on burning technology, get the latest and more efficient burning technology. We introduced VSDs into the factories, um, and a whole horde of um, uh, projects were done at different uh, members to try and make them more sustainable. Environmental impact of uh, clay bricks, and this is where I talk a little bit about our LCA and how we did it. Uh, we all know that we one of the largest CO2 emitters in the world. Uh, I'm told we're the 12th largest. I'm not sure if that's correct, but I think we're nearly there. And then 40% of our local emissions is, is obviously uh, coming from uh, the fact that we heat and cool our buildings. Okay, what did we want to um, achieve with this LCA? Uh, we wanted to quantify the resources um, consumed and the emissions produced. We wanted to look at um, different clay brick production technologies, in other words, clam kilns versus tunnel kilns versus VSPKs. We wanted also to look at the different energy efficiency of different walls. And then we also, uh, at the end, uh, looked at the social and economic impact that we as an industry has on uh, not only our staff, but also our sending environment. Um, this LCA was done by the University of Pretoria and it was governed by ISO 14000 and 14040, and uh, it was peer-reviewed by uh, Qantas in Zurich, Switzerland, so it followed all the, the normal ISO um, uh, regulations, and uh, we, one of the first, if not the first building product, um, that did local building product that did an LCA locally. We looked at all the impacts, in other words, from uh, extraction or mining of, of clay, uh, the production phase, the transport, the construction, the use of the building, and this is quite important, and then demolition, recycling, or waste disposal. Um, we had to look uh, at where all the impacts is across the life of a clay brick, and it was found that the biggest impact is in the operation of a lived-in house. And we looked at that over a 50-year period. Uh, this is where we have an uh, impact as brick makers, so obviously we couldn't ignore that, although it was not as significant as the operation of the house. So um, on the actual production phase, we also went in depth in there to see what our impact is. And obviously because we use a lot of um, uh, coal in our plants, 88% of the impact on the, the production side is from our kiln and firing of our dryers. And then the rest, uh, preparation, extracting, uh, crushing, grinding, and dispatching uh, forms the rest. Some of the uh, results, and here I'm talking about uh, sector le level average. Uh, to produce one kilogram of clay brick, um, there's about 3.5 megajoules 
of fossil fuel energy used, and this, I must add again, was already in 2013-14. Uh, subsequent studies showed that that went closer to free, so there is an improvement, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. This is a result of the, the, the LCA, uh, and that equates to about 0.27 kilograms of CO2 equivalent emissions. Um, on an annual basis, uh, consumed about 33.5 billion megajoules of non-renewable energy. Just to put that into context, uh, to make one clay brick is the equivalent of boiling five kettles. During the uh, data collection of this LCA, uh, we used independent people to go around all the factories. So we had to make sure that the information we got from the factories were 100% correct. So independent people that had knowledge of brick, makers, brick making went to all the, the members and non-members and got the, um, the input. And there we looked at from clay extraction, stockpiling, preparation, the actual uh, drying, firing, and all factory overheads were taken into consideration. And uh, 86 of the 102 brickmakers uh, that was identified participated, which gave the university a 95% um, sample, which was quite good. Just quickly, um, these were the type of kilns that were looked at, and this is um, clam kilns, 68% of bricks in South Africa, typically uh, plaster bricks is made in clam kilns, and then uh, second biggest type of technology is tunnel kilns, and then obviously you've got TBA, the VSP case that I referred to earlier, and some zigzag kilns. So we also looked at the different technologies. We then um, modeled and looked at the impact of these different technologies across four impact zones, uh, ecosystem quality, human health, non-renewable non-renewable resources, and climate. So uh, we looked at all the different technologies and what the impact was across these four impact zones. We also looked uh, in the LCA, uh, we looked at transport and construction. We looked at all materials required for a square meter of wall to be built. Uh, that, that includes plaster, paint, wall tiles, everything that's needed. Um, we also looked at the distance that we had to transfer the product to, to site. So every factory had to give an average distran distance. And then we looked at three uh, typical wall types. And we also looked at those uh, in either face brick or plaster and paint. And those three different wall types were 220 double brick wall, uh, 270, that should be 70, 270 cavity brick wall, and 280 insulated cavity brick wall. Now the use phase, uh, as I said earlier, this is uh, that 85%, this is where it's the biggest impact occurred. And I've just got a small, a short video that uh, demonstrate uh, the thermal performance uh, against the, the, the actual material density or the product that you use. So just bear with me. I hope this works. Um, we looked at, uh, obviously we compared the energy electricity consumption in a typical South African home using, those, uh, using different wall types. Um, we also looked uh, at this modeling uh, where uh, thermal comfort exists, in other words, between about 20 and 24 degrees Celsius. And then we looked at six wall types, uh, free clay brick, with or without insulation, and three other common walling materials. And then we also looked at three different building types, a uh, 40 square meter house, 130 square meter house, and a 2,000 square meter small office. And we looked at these, uh, we looked at these um, uh, models or these houses over six climatic zones. Some of the results, um, very clear that, uh, and yeah, I'm talking about 40 square meter housing that across all the climatic zones, um, in a 40 square meter house, uh, cavity clay brick wall with insulation performed the best consistently, uh, followed then by um, cavity wall compared to the other building materials. Uh, in a 130 square meter residential, uh, very much a similar picture. Um, So 
So what we learned from that is residential buildings, uh, the best or the lowest energy use, uh, thermal, thermally insulated uh, clay brick cavity walling, uh, non-residential uh, 220 mole solid clay brick walling. So uh, what it came down to, building an insulated cavity wall rather than a solid wall has a 30% less impact on the climate over a 50 year lifespan. Again, to put it into uh, context, um, the 70% energy saving is like um, three to seven passenger cars off the road for a month every day that this building is in use. We also, as part of the, because it was a cradle to grave uh, life cycle assessment, we obviously had to look at demolition and disposal. This was a desktop study, uh, and I must admit there's not a lot of um, formal information in terms of demolition and disposal in this country. Uh, what we could find uh, was that 36% of clay bricks are estimated to be recycled. Now, we as producers know that it, it, it is a lot more. There's a huge informal recycling operation happening at these uh, dump sites and on, on building sites whereby informal people go and they, they um, would uh, recycle and sell the bricks out of hand and there's absolutely no record about that. But this is something that, as an association, we, we, um, we're keen to, to do another study because we believe that it is a lot better. And it's something that we all need to focus. As was mentioned also earlier in one of the presentations, that this is an area we need to look at. Uh, key findings of the LCA. Uh, obviously, the environmental impacts is driven by our dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, BRICS' biggest impact uh, due to electricity use for uh, heating and cooling is in its use phase. The highest production impacts occur in the kilns, and then different kiln technologies have got different impacts, uh, and they perform, not one of them perform better over uh, all the environmental impact zones, but it's generally accepted that continuous kiln technologies perform the best. What we also did is, apart from the environmental LCA that the University of Pretoria did, we did a social and economic LCA. Here we followed um, UNIP guidelines. Um, we thought this was very important. Uh, we didn't think the environmental LCA on its own uh, was good enough, so we wanted to have the social and economic impact as well. Uh, and there is no ISO guidelines, so we followed the UNEP guidelines, and we had a 78% sample there as well from members. And we looked at uh, these different impact zones. We looked at human rights, uh, working conditions, governance, health and safety, and socio socioeconomic repercussions. Um, some of the uh, impacts is that for every million bricks that we produce, we provide four jobs. 74% um, of our supplies come from SMMEs, and we all know the pressure on using SMMEs. And as an industry, um, a lot of the supplies actually do come from SMMEs. And then we spend about 6 rand 50 for every 1,000 bricks on community development. Um, one of the things that's, that's important here is, uh, although you see a lot of big brick factories around the Gauteng, area, there's a lot of small factories in the smaller towns, so there's a lot of rural employment happening in our industry, and a lot of these people are members of the association. Then uh, something that I'm quite proud of uh, is that last year the association put out its first sustainability report. Uh, similar associations across the world already about five to ten years down the road with, with sustainability. So what we did is we took some of the previous um, uh, data that was, that was collected in terms of brick making in South Africa with the LCA data, with subsequent data collected by uh, Swiss Contact. And we um, then put together our first sustainability report. And this is something that we will update on the, every three years. Uh, because it's our first, um, we're not there yet where we can set ourselves targets, but that would be the next step after putting out the second sustainability report in a, probably another two years. As an industry, we want to make commitments, we want to set ourselves targets that by 2025, this is where we want to be in terms of sustainability. And yeah, obviously, as we all know, we don't only look at energy, we looked at water, we looked at materials, 
um, all across the board. So we promote inclusive sustainable practices in our sector. Something before I end off, I just want to uh, say is that after the Swiss um, left us at the end of last or middle of last year, and they contributed and assisted us with a lot of these projects, we've now got the EU uh, on board, and the theme on this uh, project is Switch Africa Green, and it's only about sustainability, and in that uh, project, and it's going to last for the next three years, we're going to look at the informal brickmakers, we're going to look at gathering information from them, assist them to become uh, more compliant, assist them to become more sustainable, and also look at improving the quality of their, their product because essentially they also make clay brick products but not at the right qualities. We also, uh, with the EU help, we're going to continue with our sustainability reporting and obviously as an association show our commitment to sustainability by setting ourselves targets over the next 10 to 15 years that we want to achieve. Thanks.